name is Autumn Bryant, speech language pathologist. I currently work with international students who are acquiring American English because that is not their first language or dialect. And I've been working with them for um, here at the university for almost a year now, but I've also had private clients for accent modification for the past five or six years. And recently I started using the grandfather passage in a more systematic way. So we all know that the grandfather passage is a staple in terms of listening for someone's pronunciation and voice, but I've added more details to it to also assess for prosody. So I want to take you through what I do. First, I have the client read the grandfather passage in its standard form, and then I use this new set of forms that I've come up with to analyze their speech. So the first form has the grandfather passage written in IPA. So let's take a look at that. So here's the standard form that they read. And then here's the version written in the International Phonetic Alphabet or IPA. And as you can see, um, you have marks there for uh, which syllable gets the stress. But if you notice that here in parentheses, I've also added when there are more than one way that someone could, when there's more than one way that someone could uh, pronounce this word. So for example, the and the, these are both acceptable pronunciations of the word T-H-E. So here in parentheses, you would just listen and then circle which one they use. And I tended to put the one that was a reduction or uh, the preferred version to the right. And they also have a uh, subscripted number by them. And this is so that later I can use another form and easily count how many times the person made that particular change. So let me show you the next form here which will be this one. So for example, if the person says the, I'm gonna circle the uh, and then I would go to number four here. And there were five instances where that change to the instead of the could have happened. So they just got one of them. But usually I go back and do this at the end. Usually I listen to the whole passage first. So let me take you through a little bit what that would sound like. And this is just a recording of my own voice reading the passage, but I tried to change my voice a little bit so that um, you can easily hear the difference between me narrating what we're doing here and the grandfather passage. So let's take a listen. The grandfather passage. Okay, so there I did use that a uh pronunciation for the, so that's already marked correctly. You wish to know all about my grandfather? Okay, let's see what I did. You wish to know all about. So instead of all about where it's kind of disjointed, I did all about. And then sometimes I need to back the track up a little bit and listen again just to make sure I'm not missing anything. Wish to know all about my grandfather? What? And then there I might mark my inflection pattern was kind of up. So these dark gray squares are to indicate where the pitch is likely to go down. But I kind of said this one like a question. So I'm just going to mark that that was up, which was not what was expected. Uh, he is nearly 93 years old. Okay, so now we have another set for parentheses. So instead of he is, where it sounds disjointed, I inserted like a little bit of a ya sound here and I said he is. He is nearly 90, I pronounced a flap uh, sound rather than 90, I said it more like 90. Yet he still, well, he is nearly 93 years old. Yet he still thinks. Okay, next set. Yeti. So I did not pronounce the H. I did not say yet he. I said Yeti. So again, I changed this T sound to a flap because it was between vowels once I also deleted that H. So two changes right there very quickly. Let's listen to that again. Three years old. Yet he still thinks as swiftly as ever. Okay, so hear all of that. So that's a good example of what we're listening for. Let's try the next one. Now we're thinks and as connected. Let's see. Yet he still thinks as swiftly as ever. I think so. Um, I'm not sure about that ah though. I'm not sure that was a clear ah sound or if it was more like a schwa. Let's go back and listen. Nearly 93 years old. Yet he still thinks as swiftly as ever. Yeah, I could not hear a full ah there. So I'm going to cross that one out. And then let's see about that change between as and swiftly. Did I connect those two words? Yet he still thinks as swiftly as ever. Yeah, I would say so. And then let's um, try just 
uh, one more sentence after this one. Still thinks as swiftly as ever. There's another y sound inserted. He dresses himself in. Okay, so I have the H here because it was at the beginning of a sentence or a phrase, but I dropped this one. He dresses himself. There was no H there either. As swiftly as ever. He dresses himself in an ancient. Inan. So you kind of get uh, another in sound on the off glide of this one. So it wasn't in n, it was in none. Black frock coat. Usually not an ancient black frock coat. An ancient black frock. He dresses himself in an ancient black. Now here in English, there are a couple of different acceptable pronunciations for ancient. Uh, mine, I think, sounded more like the k and sh together, ancient. So that's the one I'm circling there, but that won't really factor into anything. It's just something to note. Now, did you hear frock coat? I did not release this K because another K was coming right afterward. So they were together, frock coat, rather than frock coat. Usually mine is several buttons. Okay, and there was a glottal T, so I didn't say buttons or buttons, I said buttons. All right, and I think that gives you a good picture of what we're looking for here, so I won't do the whole passage. Let's come over here now to this other form, and we can see here that I've already marked that first the in spot four. Um, the next one was, this was number five, and I did that one, so we're going to mark that one. Then we had number two. Number two, I did that. Uh, then we had number three. Got one of those. Number seven. Let's see. Uh, another, another number seven. Two of those in a row. Number nine. Number two, one, three. So one, two, three. Number nine, two. That one doesn't have a mark. One. Okay. And then what was this one? Eight. So we had nine, two, one, and eight. So as we can see from this sampling, um, I am using a number of markers of the fluency patterns of English. I'm linking consonants together when they are occurring back to back and it's the same consonant or a very similar consonant. Um, I am linking vowels together by inserting, I'm sorry, I'm linking consonants to vowels. So kind of doubling the sound there and putting it at the beginning of the next syllable, all about. I'm linking vowels together by inserting a ya or a wa, he is. Uh, I also use the schwa pronunciation for the. We don't have it noted for ta instead of tu yet, but I think that's just because we hadn't gotten there in the recording. I'm pretty sure I do that too. I use the flap T pronunciation for 90. I use the glottal T pronunciation in buttons. And I do sometimes omit this H sound at the beginning of pronouns like himself, dresses himself instead of dresses himself. But then uh, most of my stress patterns sounded like typical American English speech. Um, I kind of went up at the end of a statement though. So we might mark this one here where at the top, we marked if we did hear something. Now we're marking if we didn't hear something. So there was one instance where we didn't hear what we expected for sentence level stress. But for word level stress, that was pretty much what we expected. Um, an example of something unexpected might be like my grandfather. If I stress the second syllable there, my grandfather. But I put my stress on the first syllable in grandfather, just like we expected. So there was nothing that we will mark here as tallying um, unexpected or non-standard kind of pronunciation or stress pattern, I should say, for this. And then once we have this, uh, we could also look at how I'm pronouncing sounds. So one change that we did note was that on as, let's see, let's take come down here. We have the consonants at the top, as well as how many opportunities for each sound um, there was in the passage. And then we have an example of what that sound is, like a word that has the sound and it's underlined there. And so we're going to come down here for vowels. And there was one time where as, which was at the beginning of a word, 
sounded like us. I think that was just because it was linked with the next one. Um, and so it kind of got reduced and neutralized or centralized. But what we could do if we really wanted to is we could even tally how many times did I do that? So far, one. Um, if it's a one-time thing, it might just be, you know, a, a feature of that sentence or a quirk. Um, but if we notice that every time I was supposed to say, ah, I did it, and we have several tally marks, then that might be worth noting. Um, and then what I would do is I would come up here to the report version and I would probably just copy and paste here. So we were looking for ab, ah, but I did a, uh, whoops. So I'm gonna copy that. And then in the ass ah spot, I would just paste it in there. And then by the end, especially if you're analyzing the speech of a non-native speaker, you will have this all filled out. And then this is in the report template. So I would change this to the person's name that submitted it. We're going to call this AB Oops. submitted a uh, speech sample on, we'll enter the date, and it was analyzed by, this is where you'll put your name, the speech pathologist. The rest of that is pretty much the same. We're just changing the spots with the X's. And then we will make some comments on the pronunciation. AB's pronunciation was uh, very clear and intelligible to this, to this native speaker of American English. She made changes to consonant sounds, including whatever changes we heard. And AB made changes to vowel sounds, including a uh for a. Ah. Um, and we might note on what were the most notable changes because just because I changed something doesn't necessarily mean it wasn't clear. There are a lot of sounds that American speakers might change, but we understand them pretty well. But there are others that are pretty hard for us to figure out in some non-native speaker speech. So I like to prioritize what's making the biggest impact. And then I have a section here that describes the fluency changes that we were tallying just before. And then I would note AB exhibited um, most of the features of American English that were described above, including this one and that one. Maybe these other ones were not consistently observed, like reducing to to ta. We didn't get to that one, so we didn't hear that one. Um, and the stress patterns were fairly fairly American-like, but there were there was one instance where it was different. Um, and so fluency could be enhanced by making the changes noted here. Thank you for allowing me to listen and then sign with the date. So this is a full packet. You get um, a printout of the grandfather passage, which this is online anywhere. You don't need the packet for this, but there are different versions. So this version that I have with it corresponds to the version that's here in IPA. And then you get the fluency chart, so you can mark that off. This one where you can see how many of each target phoneme uh, was, was there for each one. And then you get the report template, and it also comes with instructions and a cover page. Uh, the cover page is pretty cute.